Welcome back to Bumblebee. Here are the top 10 scandalous events from the Middle Ages, part four, excuse me. Also, stick around to the end of this video because I'm gonna respond to some comments, some, some comments I had to talk about here. This is getting wild. Let's dive in. Kicking off the list at number 10, the disappearance of the Norse. I just watched The Northman and that was a great time. Highly recommend. Fantastic movie. I'm gonna start barking at dogs, just like he did. That's how I'm gonna do it now. Norse mythology is fascinating, yet of course, mysterious. They settled in Greenland for over 400 years and they left quite the mark, I'd say, or maybe not as much as we'd think. We look at Norse history as violent and bearded and mighty, but Vikings, they were nice, okay? They invented hockey, they skied, women had a large amount of rights compared to what we often see on this channel. And even today in general. But one of life's greatest mysteries are where Greenland's Vikings went. They seemingly disappeared. The only remains are crumbling church walls that were used for barely 500 years. That's nothing. Archeologists are still unsure what happened to the Norse population. Maybe it was a plague, maybe it was the Inuit, or perhaps they settled back in Europe. It's really hard to tell. Recent excavations provide hints that they settled in the West, most likely relying on trade to survive. So maybe they just followed the goods, but again, Life's greatest mysteries, we have no idea. Number nine, Shroud of Turin. I can't believe it's taken me four parts to mention this, let's go. This legendary cloth is dated back to the late 1200s, early 1300s, you know, that old time. This holy cloth appears to show the image of a man, presumably one J. Christ. It's four meters long and one meter wide, and it sits permanently in the Cathedral of Turin in Northern Italy. So if you're in the area, go take a peek at what many believe to be the burial shroud in which Jesus was wrapped in, you know, after his crucifixion. Sometimes I wake up and I see the outline of my own face in the pillowcase and I think, ah, oh, is that Jesus? Who is this handsome chap right here? Covered in drool. So much drool. Number eight, keel hauling. Not to be confused with Kegels, although that also takes a great amount of work. Keel hauling was reserved for the worst of the worst at sea. Yeah, this is some high seas punishments. Here we go. This was used by pirates for sailors who disobeyed orders and whatnot. The victim would be suspended by a rope with rocks or weights around their ankles, and then they'd be lowered to the keel of the ship where, you know, all the ship barnacles and nasty stuff live. And then they would get dragged all around those, plus water pain and drowning. It's a lot, it's a deadly combination. Anything to do with barnacles or the sea, zero chance. I'm not messing with either of those. I'll tell you anything, Blackbeard, literally anything. Number seven, water punishments. Eh, since we're on the topic, let's dive in a bit more. Pun intended. Taking a step away from the worst physical thing that one could possibly go through, let's look at how far the mind will go before it too breaks. Sensory deprivation, it's still around in today. In fact, there's many who pay for it, believe it or not. Yeah, a fun experience today is paying to lay in a dark tub full of salt and water and then floating. It's a magical experience, some would say. It's magical because your senses are powerful, especially combined with water. So the dripping machine, the water punishment, anything around that is just all bad, especially in medieval times. Ice cold water dripping on your forehead over and over and over for hours and hours. It's one of the worst and oldest punishments. Everybody's heard about this in some way, shape or form. In medieval times, they would do it as well. The drops would be at different times too, so you couldn't predict it. You can't see right now, but my toes are wiggling. They're wiggling around in my Berks and socks. In medieval times, they would tie you down and then using a horn, this big funnel, they would pour nine pints of water um, in your mouth sometimes, yeah. Pain was a form of punishment. This was the normal at one point. I feel sick, I feel so sick. They would do that with wine sometimes too. They'd make people, uh, jesters, chug wine. That was in Game of Thrones one episode. Number six, the breaking wheel. Okay, this one isn't even creative. This is just bad and like just humans at their worst. The breaking wheel is literally just a large disc, a pirate ship wheel almost, where somebody is tied to it and then everyone else just hammers them over and over. They just beat the out of them. But of course, since we're talking about medieval times, everything has to be a show, it has to be, some guy's always doing this in medieval times when it's like a guy being punished horribly. He's like, ha ha, it's so stupid. So once the accused was beaten and then presumed dead, the wheel would lift up and then turn, you know, to show everybody what's up, what happens if you steal a loaf of bread, I guess. The other way is they would tie a person to the wheel and then continue to rotate it. All the while the ropes would get tighter and tighter around your body. Yeah, it's kind of like the rack, but with a twist. 
<sighs> Pun intended. Number five, the Great Fire of London. Back in the 1600s, London saw quite the blaze. The Great Fire of 1666. Now, in the Bible, it references the number 666 as the number of the beast, living, you know, in the depths below and all that good stuff. So many Christians in Europe back in the 1600s believed that the world was going to end in 1666, kind of like our version of the Mayan calendar debacle back in 2012. Well, the thing is, the Great Fire actually did happen that year. Yeah, it happened September 2nd to September 5th. The blaze destroyed the entire city, including 87 churches and 13,000 homes. See, many saw this, of course, as said prophecy to the end of the world coming true, but with all the property damage, the death toll for this great fire was relatively low, as only 10 people died. That's less than half the lives lost in the Salem witch trials, so could be worse. Not great, but surprisingly low for what you would think, looking at this. Number four, Greek fire. More fire facts coming in hot. Puns, a lot of puns today. A blazing mystery, this one is. Okay, Greek fire had scholars and pyromaniacs stumped for decades. This powerful incendiary weapon was used during the seventh century. The Byzantine Empire was on the top of their game with this one. Imagine being the first human to weaponize fire. How terrifying is that? That's horrible. It's been referred to as Roman fire or sticky fire. Many resources suggest that water made this situation worse. The Greek fire was only enhanced with water. That was the magic back then. The trick here was using combustible substances like sulfur, petroleum, all that bad stuff. They would blast it from a safe distance to other ships. The only way to put out Greek fire was copious amounts of sand, vinegar, and urine. Yeah, the third one, no problem. We got lots of that on board. Especially when a Greek fire syringe is facing your ship. Yeah, lots of urine on standby. Just say the word. I'm shaking with fear. Number three, Viking funerals. Now, I know this isn't really messed up, but I really wish we still did these today. This would be a spectacle. Vikings would do funerals in one of two ways. Both were pretty epic to witness back in the day. One, they would bury the body, the classic. They would leave stone circles around the shallow graves that they dug, or they would do burial mounds or grave fields, usually after a large battle. Vikings were pagan, so they believed that the more smoke during a cremation, the better. That was their way of reaching the afterlife. Again, beautiful, ceremonic, 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 that's not a word. Boats also symbolized safe passage to said afterlife in Norse mythology. So Vikings would shape these stones around the grave like a ship, or these mounds would be shaped like a boat of some sorts. How beautiful is that? But high-ranking Norsemen, they would be buried with their boats. In 834 AD, the Osberg ship burial honored two women. This ship vessel was 70 feet long and 17 feet wide. There's 15 oars on each side. It was quite the spectacle. It was discovered in Norway on a farm. So the whole shooting an arrow while they're at sea thing, yeah, it wasn't as common as we believe. Because if you missed, you just gave away the Osberg. And you botched a funeral at the same time. Way to go. So more often than not, they would do these ceremonies on land with the arrow and the fire. Which is good news for me, because I have terrible aim. If I was alive back then, I would have missed every time. Number two, not so great flood. This one is most likely how we'll meet our collective demise. I'm gonna call that. Back in the 1500s, German mathematician and astrologer, Johann Stoffler, predicted that a great flood would cover the world and result, of course, in the death of humanity as we know it. Haha, <laughs> great, he even pinpointed a date. How specific is that? We love warnings, we love heads up here. The date was apparently February 25th, 1524. This was when all the planets would be aligned under Pisces, a water sign, so naturally they thought there would be a large flood. I see the connection, I get it. I'm not totally off board here. Soon after he made said prediction, hundreds of pamphlets were spread around warning of this great flood. And as you can imagine, this caused a lot of panic. A German nobleman believed this, maybe a bit too much, so he gathered all of his resources to build a three-story ark. Yeah, he went full on Noah for this doomsday prediction. The guy had a three-story ark built. The amount of effort in that, come on. In the end though, thankfully, when the day of February 25th, 1524 arrived, it did rain, but it was a light one at most. So there's no flooding going on here. Not yet, at least. And finally, number one, the green-skinned children. This legend comes from the village of Woolpit in Suffolk, England. The story goes that in the 12th century, two children, a brother and a sister, just suddenly appeared in the village, out of nowhere. And as their name suggests, they had green skin. Not blue, they weren't avatars. I looked, I checked twice. So obviously my first thought is aliens, for sure. When the children were first found, they were acting kind of sketchy, they seemed nervous, and were seemingly speaking gibberish. To be fair, they were discovered near a wolf pit, so that could explain the nervousness, right? Um, but also, and most importantly, they were green. That's, we're gonna focus on that one today. After they were found, they were taken back to the home of Sir Richard de Cain, where he of course offered them food, water, and shelter, all that good stuff. But they were all set, yeah. And apparently they refused to eat. 
What's going on here? The only thing they decided to eat over the next few days were green beans that they consumed straight out of the ground. Yeah, raw, there we go. A couple of green beans eating green beans. What a sight. As the children lived with Richard over the following years, he taught them how to speak, and once they had the English tongue down, they told Richard that they're actually inhabitants of the land St. Martin, who is regarded with peculiar veneration in the country which gave us birth. And that they only vaguely remember what happened before they arrived on our planet. So yeah, they're from another planet and not a lot makes sense here. They are with their father hearing the St. Edmund's bell chiming and then all of a sudden they were just teleported to this field in England. So, parallel universes, I guess they're real too. Who knew? That's what you get in a part four. Those are the top 10 scandalous events for the Middle Ages part four, but as promised, I shall respond to a few comments because it's been a while. Let's do it. 73 Honda 350, great name. They say, 500 years later, we are now aghast at what were accepted practices in the Middle Ages. How will people in 2522 react to what we consider normal and okay today? I know, I think about this often. I think about video games that are violent and I'm like, mm, I'll give it five more years. I don't think we're getting Grand Theft Auto 6, I'll be honest with you. I think we're gonna slowly lean away from violent video games. That's my prediction for the next 200 years. Jacqueline Murray says, I love the way Taylor pronounces some words. So wrong in Australia. Well, as long as they're only wrong in Australia and not wrong everywhere, I'll take that. That's a minor setback. We can learn from that one. Luanda Nunn says, Taylor, you are too funny. I'll get you a pole vault for Christmas. Please do. Then I can pull vaults over large puddles and then, and then not be late anymore for work. <laughs> also, I want to pull vault. I feel like that's going to be my next hobby that I fail at. No way. I can never pull vaults. Awesome. I've been your host, Taylor McWaters, and I'll see you next time on Bumblebee. I'm going to go drink this really fast. Bye. <laughs> Almost threw up. <clears throat> Crucific crucification. Crucific. Crucific, ho ho, crucify, crucifixion, crucifixion, right? Crucifix, oh, that's why I'm like, that's not right. Crucifixion, crucification, crucif, get out of here, little spider.